lecture series, and we are very pleased today to welcome back our good friend, Professor Sergio Laporta. This lecture and our speaker is a staple of our lecture series. We depend on him to provide an explanation of why the Armenian genocide happened, what ramifications it has for the Armenian people, and why its recognition as a genocide even today is incomplete. And we hear many times in this course the infamous attributed quote to Adolf Hitler, after all, who today remembers the Armenians? Ooh, our duty to make sure that that doesn't happen. Dr. Laporta received his BA at Columbia and his PhD at Harvard University in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. He was a lecturer in Armenian studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem before settling at CSU Fresno, which sponsors a very broad program of Armenian studies in the midst of a very large Armenian community. Professor Laporta is currently the High and Isabel Berberian Professor of Armenian Studies at CSU Fresno. He is also the Associate Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. Please welcome. Thank you very much, Diane. I, I, I'd like to thank you for all your years of service heading this program, directing the lecture series. I know it's, it takes a lot of work and effort. Um, I also like to thank the members of the Alliance uh, for their support of the program and for welcoming me every year. Is this the, the 12th? Yeah. The 12th year that I've, yeah. that I've come. Um, and I'd also like to know the state for extending um, the permission for me to come in person. Uh, I know I'm the only lecturer, I think, this semester that's lecturing here in person. And really, these were, this was for two reasons, um, both academic and personal, that I insisted that I come in person. The, the first, uh, sort of personal, was like, I hate talking to my computer screen. It's just not good for me. Um, it, I don't get very much out of it. Um, I find, having done this for over a decade, that I learn so much when I come up here through the interaction, the personal interaction with people, both before, during, and after the lecture. So thank you for that. The other uh, reason um, that's academic is that we are talking about genocide. And genocide requires the dehumanization of people. And it becomes very easy on Zoom, especially when talking about the Armenian genocide, which happened over 100 years ago, to forget the human aspect of it. So I, I'll try to um, put that into context as well. But hopefully being in person helps. And then finally, um, another personal reason um, is that in the past year we lost three friends. Um, that's been very difficult. It was hard to find out um, about the loss of Myrna and the loss of Mac and the loss of Larissa. Three supporters of this program, um, three friends, um, and I can't imagine that happened. And I am very sorry that I did not and was not able to see them one last time last year because of the pandemic. Um, and, and so before any of that, I don't want anybody else to disappear on me this year. Um, but I, I did want to see everybody um, uh, again, because it, it was a, it's a giant loss for Sonoma State, for the Alliance, uh, and for me personally. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. I know you had to come out here for this. Uh, thankfully, it's a nice day. It's not pouring rain. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, you will have a great conversation afterwards. And I will try to get through a lot of material in, in an hour and 15 minutes. So please feel free, or an hour maybe, um, to ask as many questions as you'd like afterwards. So keeping in uh, with the uh, overall theme of this year's lecture series, um, I will uh, talk about three things today. Today's goal. So first of all, like I said, I'd like you to know who the Armenians are. It's going to be very brief because of our time constraints, but at least to give you some idea of who the Armenians were before we talk about how they were eliminated from their historical homeland. So that will be the second part, the history of the Armenian Genocide, how it, um, how it happened, um, and uh, what its effects uh, were on, uh, on the Middle East and the world. Um, and then, in keeping with uh, the theme of this year's uh, lecture series about um, repeating patterns, um, troubling signs for the future. Although the Armenian Genocide happened over 100 years ago, there's a good case to be made that it hasn't been completed. Um, and that there, is, there are actions occurring right now that are aiming to finish what was started 115 years, well, 120, uh, 170 years ago. Yeah. 180 years ago. So let's start off with the um, uh, 
uh, who are the Armenians. And I just begin quickly with a slide here of some things that may be familiar to some of you. First of all, Armenians are known for food, such as rice pilaf and dolma, that stuff great, please. Also in the music industry, with System of a Down, very famous, or if you're more of a classical person, out of Kajaturia. Um, in, in the um, entertainment business, we have Cher there, and then all the way on the, uh, to the far right, Parker Corian, who um, basically turned MGM from a movie studio into a casino business and built up uh, Las Vegas, uh, became one of the wealthiest people in America, and recently died, and he's originally from Fresno, so we're very proud of him. Um, and then other people like Kim Kardashian, obviously I think you uh, uh, recognize there. And then writers uh, such as William Soroyan, oh, and then the famous chess player Gary Kasparov, uh, who is half Armenian, half Jewish, uh, but uh, is quite not only just a chess champion, but also a champion of human rights and political freedom around the world. Um, so these are just some Armenian notables, so that people are, even if you may not know a lot about Armenia, you're probably familiar with at least uh, a couple of these people, and there are many more I could have listed, but these came to mind. But if we're looking at significant factors of Armenian um, self-identity, um, I would say one of, these are the salient points that almost any Armenian would at least point to one or at least two of these as um, like in, integral to their uh, idea of themselves. So first is that they have a long history. Uh, they like to trace themselves back to Mount Ararat, that's what you see there, um, where Noah's Ark landed, and that uh, with the dispersion of people after the flood, uh, the Armenians uh, settled in, in direct descendants. I think Barbara's out there looking for the place if someone wants to get her. Uh, sorry. Um, the descendants uh, of, the, uh, of the biblical uh, patriarchs in direct line. So they think it, they really do feel this long history um, and throughout uh, their culture that they go back at least 3,000 years and, and, and they feel connected to that, uh, to that history. Likewise, they feel very connected to their Christian faith. Whether they're practicing or not, they, they're proud of the fact that they were the first nation to accept Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century, uh, that they were not the first Christians, but the, the king at the time, King uh, Tirdat, um, accepted Christianity and made it the official religion of the country, and he was the fo first to do that at the beginning of the fourth century. And they have their own church um, that still is around today. Uh, it's known as the Armenian Apostolic Church. There are also uh, Armenians who belong to the Roman Catholic Church, and there are also various Armenian Protestant groups. But the bulk of the Armenian uh, community belongs to the Armenian Apostolic Church, and it has its own chief prelate, uh, like the Pope in Rome. Uh, the Armenians have a Catholicos um, here um, at, at the church, which is called Echmiadzin, uh, where which means where the holy, uh, where the soul begotten descended. And it's supposedly in a vision where um, Jesus came down and, uh, and struck a hammer and leveled the ground in the plain uh, around it, and that's where they built this church. So that's why it's called Echmiadzin, even though the town is Maharshala. Um, the other one is their language, very proud of their language, uh, and their alphabet. Um, there are monuments to their alphabet. Their alphabet was invented in 406. We have an account of how it was created, which is unique. For most alphabets, we don't know. I mean, they're legendary accounts. This one is an actual account of why alphabet was needed for, uh, to translate the Bible um, and how it was created. And these are the 36 letters uh, that were first uh, created. Um, and it, as you can see, they're arranged in four columns of nine. And so they double as uh, the numbers as well. So the first column is the ones column, then you have the tens column, the hundreds column, the thousands column. The letter A, which is that first one on the top left, uh, that's the letter I, that's the number one. And, and then you have the uh, letter K at the end, bottom right, that's 9,000. So you can write any number between one and 9,999 with Armenian letters. Not great for math, but... <laughs> It is very handy for writing dates or anything that you may want to, um, uh, may want to write down just to represent uh, uh, numbers. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the, the sort of um, dialectic between homeland and dispersion. Uh, and, I, and I use dispersion here because Armenians have lived outside of their historical homeland for, for centuries. Uh, there have been constant movements of Armenians back and forth from the, the historical homeland of the Armenian people. Um, as well as then, especially after the Armenian Genocide, when we get more of what we consider a diaspora uh, community all around, uh, all around the world. But regardless of whether someone had uh, left, let's say, the homeland in, uh, after 1915, when the genocide occurred, or whether they had left 200 years earlier, there is always this tie to that homeland. Uh, whether they lived there 
next day or whether they live in diaspora, um, there is a feeling that their homeland does exist now. How that is imagined differs from person to person, but nonetheless, there is a feeling uh, that they have a homeland, that they're not able to live in all of it uh, right now, um, and but that historically, uh, they have this connection to this land. And then, so just to give you an idea of where Armenia is today, you can see this is the Republic of Armenia today, sort of a small uh, state to the south of Georgia, to the east of uh, Turkey, to the north of Iran, and to the west uh, of uh, Azerbaijan. It's a tough neighborhood, um, and uh, it's gotten tougher for them uh, recently. Um, but historically, you can see they, this, in the 19th century, uh, and in the early 20th century, they occupied a much larger um, area of land. This is not everywhere where Armenians lived throughout the Ottoman Empire, but these were the main areas uh, uh, known as the six Armenian provinces in the Armenian Empire. So the ones in green were the areas in which uh, Armenians uh, primary, primarily dwelt, both historically and in the 19th and 20th centuries. So when we're talking about the, the genocide, these are the areas um, uh, that, we're, that we're really discussing. Um, the ones that were in um, whatever color that is, so the yellowish rust color, um, those were not under Ottoman control, but under um, kind of Russian uh, control. And although people also suffered there by, uh, you know, because of World War I and the Bolshev Bolshevik Revolution, it was, they were part of a different historical development than the Armenians that were living under Ottoman control. So let, let's turn uh, now to uh, the Armenian genocide itself. And I'm going to just start with uh, some basic uh, facts um, about it. So first, it was the way we commemorate the genocide on April 24th um, is because on April 24th, 1915, 250 Armenian intellectuals in the Ottoman Empire were arrested, and most were soon murdered. And so these consisted of political figures, artists, um, church figures, anybody who could have led the community in any sort of resistance uh, to what was about to happen. Um, uh, were eliminated. As I will discuss, the, the plan uh, to, uh, uh, to commit the genocide predates April 24th, and there were encounters before April 24th, but traditionally we mark April 24th as the day to commemorate uh, the Armenian genocide. And so between 1915 and 1923, approximately 1.5 million people were killed, murdered, um, uh, by, by the regime. Um, 800,000 in the first four months. So that's a rate of 200,000 a month. And I say that because that's approximately, and I think this figure still stands for the Rwanda genocide, 200,000 people being murdered a month is, uh, is, is, the rate, is the same rate that has happened during the Armenian genocide. I also point it out because it's, you, in, in, when we're talking about genocide prevention, once it starts, it's very hard to stop because you're talking about such, such scale happening so quickly that even if you could get, to, if once it starts, even if you could get support over there to, to, to stop it, you would still be talking about 800,000, and I don't think you could have done anything in 1915 in, in less than four months. Um, you still would have been talking about the elimination of 800,000 people. Um, so that places a lot of the burden on preventing genocide before it actually starts, um, which is also has its own difficulties, as I'm sure you discussed in the class. Um, the genocide occurred in the Ottoman Empire under the direction of the ruling committee of Union and Progress Party, the, the, the CUP. This was a, a, a nationalist progressive party um, that tried to reform the Ottoman Empire in many ways, uh, but part of that reformation was through the ethnic sort of homogenization of the state um, and by establishing a totalitarian state in which it controlled all power and violence uh, within the empire. It is a defining moment, and I'd like to um, note this, it's a defining moment of Arme Armenian history, but not the defining moment of Armenian history. Armenian history, as I said, is 3,000 years old. Um, it has a long and um, bright past, um, and it, it will have a long and bright future. I have no doubt about that. Um, so it is an important moment in, in Armenian history, um, and obviously it shifted, to bless you, um, the current, the contemporary situation of Armenians However, um, there, there is a future afterwards. This is not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination. And then finally, they, it is important to note that the genocide is denied to this day by the Republic of Turkey. They don't say it was a genocide. Um, they have various ways of uh, skirting the issue. 
Um, they say it was a logistics problem sometimes that they were trying to remove people from the theater of war and then, you know, it was the middle of the war and we couldn't get them food and they died. Because they even had their own scholars have noted that 800,000 people disappeared off the tax rolls uh, for 1915. Um, and so they needed to explain over. The, the positions have shifted over time to it never, to Armenians were never here is the earliest position. Uh, they were here, uh, but uh, this was not a genocide, it was just an accident, uh, to, and it wasn't that many people, to it was the confusion of war, uh, to the Armenians actually attacked us, we were defending ourselves, um, and that, and to some extent, is, I'm not going to say it's correct, but the mental attitude of the people who committed did have that fear. They do express that in their own memoranda, that they can't trust anybody who's not a Turk. Not that there was an actual rebellion or revolt going on, or that the Armenians were a threat, but they were a perceived threat by the ruling powers at the, at, at the time. However, the Armenian Genocide is recognized, despite all the money that the Republic of Turkey has poured into denying it and paying politicians and founding uh, academic positions and, and trying uh, to make sure that the genocide is continuously in doubt, it is accepted and recognized by the International Association of Genocide Scholars, so I think they know what they're doing. Um, the International Center for Transitional Justice, the Ilya Wiesel Foundation of Humanity, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, the World Council of Churches, 33 countries in the Vatican City, and thankfully as of 2019, the United States, uh, we finally were able to do it, and they, the Republic of Turkey was not happy about that. And as of 2022, Every single U.S. state and the District of Columbia has accepted and recognized uh, the genocide. And I have to say the resolution that went through the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, in 2019, it's not just that it says um, the genocide happened, there's also very active clauses in, 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 the, um, in the bills that went through, um, in, in the proclamations that went through about also countering um, genocide denial. Uh, by the Republic of Turkey is in there. Now whether we live up to that or not, or everyone lives up, that or not, lives up to that or not is a different case. There are no repercussions, but at least in theory, um, it is, we, sh we are not supposed to um, uh, support anybody who denies uh, the genocide. Um, and I have to say there are Turkish scholars, and I'll be talking about one of them today, uh, who have been re-examining their past. Um, and this is very important because this comes as a shock to them. Um, they are brought up in a system that denies that it happened. They're educated from an early age uh, that it never happened. Um, but, and it's very difficult, as any, as I'm sure everyone knows, that when you're confronted with a, an alternate, alternate narrative to what you've been brought up with, it's very difficult to overcome. And it's very painful for a lot of these um, scholars to have to go through the process of working, re I mean, they have to rework the whole narrative. It's not just, this isn't handed down to them, so they need to start from scratch each time they do this. Thankfully, um, that number, the number of scholars has, has been growing, uh, and um, I think that is a positive sign moving forward. The other thing um, I, I want to say, it's not just Armenians. Armenians um, received the brunt of the, uh, um, uh, uh, of the CUP's uh, elimination policies, but it wasn't just the Assyrian Christians um, were also uh, were, were also uh, massacred, um, and a lot of them now live, as you may know, uh, in Turlock and Stanislaus. Um, the descendants of those who fled from there um, live, uh, live in California, as well as New Jersey. Um, we don't have exact numbers on that. A lot more research has to be done on, on, on their genocide, uh, but it's over half of their population was, uh, was, was killed. Um, and likewise, uh, the Greek genocide, uh, uh, where numbers, again, not entirely uh, fixed, but they range from 450 to 900,000, culminating in, in, in the catastrophe at Smyrna in 1922, um, in which about 100,000 Greeks and Armenians were killed uh, when the uh, Ottoman forces burned the, burned the city and the fire pushed um, um, many people uh, into the water. Those who weren't killed were uh, drowned um, as they were pushed uh, into, the, into the water. And I have to say, um, these two genocides are also recognized by the International Association of Genocide Scholars in 2007 and by the Republic of Armenia in 2015 with the commemoration of the centenary of uh, the Armenian Genocide. So, 
How do we get to the point where the Ottoman Empire feels it needs to eliminate the entire Armenian population? Um, in the early 16th century, uh, the Ottomans captured uh, Western Armenia. And for many centuries, I don't want to say relations are good, as anybody who knows, in pre-modern history, it was never a great time to live. But for the most part, there was not any particular hatred towards Armenians in any specific way. Um, and in the 18th century, uh, many Armenians start to move to Constantinople. They, I mean, there are always, there are problems out east, um, mainly because of revolts that are known as the Jalali revolts um, that create an unstable, um, uh, an unstable political and social um, environment in eastern Anatolia. So a lot of people start moving out of rural areas towards urban areas. And this is also part of the larger process of of modernization that's going on, not just in, in the Ottoman Empire, but urban centers start to become more and more important. Armenians are very much uh, a part of this, and many of them move to Constantinople. And in the 19th century, um, you get a real affluent urban Armenian class in, in Constantinople. And it really is amazing um, what they're doing. Um, they, they are able to um, become, they're the architects of Istanbul. Architects of the Sultan. They are controllers of the of the mint, um, and I have to say, a lot of monarchs uh, use minorities because you can trust them, in the sense that um, you know they're not going to overthrow you because nobody would accept their legitimacy. So uh, I have to say, the Assad regime in Syria also favored Armenians um, because he knew there's that they weren't his enemy at the end of the day, and and so you could trust Armenians in that they weren't a threat to your political stability. They uh, were a highly educated class. They were educated, um, uh, they became educated a large part due to missionary activities, particularly by um, Western Protestant churches who went out and started forming schools. Uh, Roman Catholic missionaries also set up schools, and then the Armenians themselves felt like they needed to compete uh, with Protestant and, and Catholic schools and start setting up their own schools in imitation of them. And so uh, many Armenians uh, were, uh, were well-educated and also women which was unusual. Um, their women were particularly well-educated. And this had long-lasting import because the majority of people who survived, or many of the people who survived the Armenian genocide were women. Um, and when they moved somewhere else, they were educated, uh, or at least came from families that pride, uh, uh, prized education. And so they came with a lot of social capital in terms of what they wanted for themselves and for their children. And so they weren't uh, uh, that education that came out of the Ottoman Empire was uh, critical uh, uh, to their success in the diaspora afterwards. Um, and a, a number of reforms uh, during the 19th century are, are put into, into place. Um, these reforms all are, you know, on paper, all great. Um, they talk about the sanctity of life, protecting religious freedom, everyone's going to be treated equally, and on paper, they worked out really well. A lot of them, however, were done under pressure from European powers on the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had gone um, deeply into debt, um, and um, they borrowed from banks in Europe, and they owed European countries money, and the European countries used that as, uh, as leverage uh, to uh, enact certain reforms. Other reforms, there's education reforms, there's transportation reforms, so if you're an Armenian in like 1880, 1860 to 1880, this is probably one of the best places you can live. Constantinople, Smyrna, there's a bustling cafe life. Um, there's money coming through, there are educational opportunities, there's social mobility, and it looks like the empire is on the path towards some form of constitutional democracy, or sorry, constitutional monarchy with a sultan who may be a figurehead, but we have representation. Um, it's looking really good. Um, unfortunately, that's not the way uh, things uh, played out. And partially it's because there's a different story outside of those urban centers in the western part of the country. So the urban centers of Smyrna and, and Constantinople in the west is one story where Armenians are doing what really well. In the provinces in the east, it's a very different story. I finally corrected the slide with the map. Yes, because um, they have Caspian Sea written there. Um, so the mass of Armenians out, um, uh, out in the east were agricultural peasants. There are some smaller urban centers, there are tradesmen, there are, there are artisans, but the mass are agricultural peasants. And the reforms that are helping Armenians so much in the, in the west, 
in Constantinople and in Smyrna and the other urban areas are not really implemented or enforced in the East. And not only that, um, there's a lot of pushback by the local Muslim and, and Turkish and Kurdish uh, notables. They're not so happy that all of a sudden their privileged status is being reduced. They don't see this as getting equality, they see it as a reduction in their status. Um, and there is a real sense of lawlessness and abandonment. We do have records, Armenians writing to Constantinople, usually to the Patriarch, because the Armenian Patriarch was the head of the Armenian community. Uh, so the Bishop of Constantinople was the head of the Armenian community, and he would make um, whatever uh, complaints that the Armenians had, he would make that as an official sort of uh, complaint to, to the government. Um, there were other ways of doing this, but that was the most common way. And we have their accounts saying like, look, can you get people out here to enforce the law? You know, people are being killed, things are being stolen, and no one's doing anything about it. And the local, the local governors and the, and the, and the uh, local police have no interest in, in stopping this. So can you please uh, you know, ask the central government uh, to, get, uh, to get stricter and uh, greater control over this area? That never really happens. Um, and we can see there's also a demographic um, component to this where the Armenians are majority in the Van area, that is you get the furthest east, uh, east. And then as you start moving further west, um, they're, they're, they're pluralities and they're even a minority in some of these areas. So, and this is partially um, um, unintentional in that many Armenians moved out, other people moved in, and, then, and it's also partially intentional, uh, particularly uh, when you start seeing the, the the Ottoman government is very aware of um, uh, demographics throughout this period and tries uh, to put more um, uh, or greater Muslim populations, especially those who are coming from areas that have been lost to the European powers, whether it's in the Balkans um, or it's in the Caucasus where they're losing it to Russia. Um, many of the Muslims who lived in that, those areas with the coming of Christian European powers don't want to live there anymore. Uh, because they're worried about being persecuted there. So they all go to, to the Ottoman Empire and say, we were your, your subjects, you have to find us a place to live now. Um, and a lot of them get put uh, precisely here in the eastern provinces where the government is hoping to sort of create um, a, a stronger Muslim uh, presence against the Armenian uh, Christian. There is, um, as we move into the early 20th century, a time of hope in the coup of 1908 where the Sultan Abdul Hamid II is overthrown. Um, he was a particularly, he's basically ruling at the end of the empire and um, suffered from paranoia and anxiety, was incredibly despotic. Um, many of the people whom we know as the Young Turks, um, uh, in, in terms of the people who wanted to politically reform the Ottoman Empire, had to flee um, in 1895 and 96. He, um, uh, uh, he massacred. Um, 200,000 Armenians, uh, 200, 200,000 Armenians in, um, in, in, in the east, um, what are known as the Armenian massacres, uh, because of uh, what he said was they were a tax revolt. Um, I mean, it's, he, he was more than, he didn't, in fact, when he found out about the genocide, he lived um, to, 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 um, to, to hear about the genocide. He was, he was actually really despondent about it because he said, you just killed over a million of my taxpayers. Um, so, I mean, that's the way he saw it. So, I mean, he, he was definitely a, a, bit, um, a bit crazy. Um, and really, but everybody suffered under him, and that's why there was a revolt. They tried to get him out of power. And this was really a time of hope, because you have Armenians, you have Turks, you have Arabs, you have Greeks, all getting together now and saying, okay, we're going to start over again. We're going to revive the Ottoman Empire. We're going to do it without the Sultan. There was a there were disagreements back and forth whether we want a constitutional sultanate or we just want a pure constitutional uh, form of, of parliamentary system. But nonetheless, uh, they were successful in overthrowing him. Um, and the Young Turk constitutional government was formed, uh, in which the Armenians uh, participated. They were in the cabinet, they had parliamentary representation. They were, they again, maybe somewhat naively thought that they were on a path even though they realized that there were troubles, they thought they were on a path towards greater integration and equality uh, with, the, uh, with the rest of the country. Yet, there were problems lurking. The military nationalists 
right, known as the Committee of Union of Progress, remained dissatisfied. And this uh, particularly was uh, because of territorial losses that the Ottoman Empire continued to experience. There's also the frustrations of trying to work in a democratic system. As we know, things don't move quickly in a democratic system, and, in, and especially when you feel that your um, territories are being lost to other countries and you, your government is unable to take concerted action, these uh, people in particular felt like there needed to be greater central control with military people at the, at the forefront. And so they launched a coup in 1913, they take over power of the government, right? They shoot three of the ministers uh, right there and then, and basically a, a, a triumvirate uh, takes control. And the leaders are Enver, and these are known as the three Pashas. There was Enver Pasha, the minister of war, Talat Pasha, the minister of the interior, and as you see, the architect of the Ar uh, Armenian genocide in many respects, and Jamal Pasha, the minister of the navy. Now, one, the traditional way, and I'm going to get to this, is there's a big question. These guys take power. And as I said, Talat Pasha was the architect of the Armenian Genocide. There's been some debate, or at least uncertainty, about whether when they take power, do they already have in mind um, the, the Armenian Genocide. That is, they're waiting for a time in which they can um, do this without facing any repercussions. And, and that World War I provides that cover for doing it. Or was it something that came up on the spur of the moment in reaction? So one way of looking at it, as I said, Enver leads this giant Caucasus campaign against the Russians in January of 1915, and he blames Armenians for this loss. Because there are Armenians on the other side of the border, there are Armenians fighting for the Russian army. There are also Armenians fighting for the Ottoman army. They happen to be in two different places. But this, it's a huge disaster. He loses a, a large uh, portion of his army. At the same time, just a month later, um, we get, uh, not even a few weeks later, we have the Battle of Gallipoli, uh, which, although the Ottoman Empire wins that battle, it's a disaster for the Allies. Nonetheless, it's not easy. And they also, they lose more men on that side too. So you can see from a military political standpoint, when you're getting into early 1915, the empire is getting very nervous. The CUP is getting nervous. These are huge losses in terms of manpower. So there have been three, I would say there were two views that, I mean, from those who accepted that this was a genocide, and view one was the genocide was not actually premeditated, um, and that it evolved with the war situation, um, and it was a reaction to the loss at Sarit Kamish and the invasion at Gallipoli. That nervous about this, they wanted to shore up their fronts, they can't have anybody who may even be remotely considered uh, 100, not 100% loyal to the Ottoman Empire, and so in reaction to the loss at Saudi Kamish in, in, in particular, uh, they put this into effect. The second view was um, that there was a genocidal intent on the part of the leaders of the CUP already. That is, they knew they were going to do this, um, but they didn't know how they were going to do it. Um, and the war provided the necessary cover to perpetrate it, and so they took advantage of that. And the plan um, was formulated in order to do it um, between late March and early April. And I would say these have been the two sort of dominant views. We didn't have anything that, you know, that really said, we don't have a document from Talat Pasha saying on this day. The other thing I have to, I, I have to say that both of these views assumes Assume a top-down, um, a, a top-down model. The central government in Constantinople um, uh, uh, decides, uh, or in Istanbul decides that they're going to eliminate the Armenian population. The orders go out to the local governors. The local governors get the orders. It's wartime. You listen to your, you listen to whatever orders you get. You commit the genocide. Now. And I have to say, this is probably view number two was what I, a combination of one and two is what I have traditionally given at this lecture. However, um, Hanar Acham, uh, one of these Turkish scholars who has uh, revisited the past and, and has really been at the forefront of pushing genocidal, genocide recognition to the point where he can't even really go back to Turkey. Um, he, now, he now teaches at UCLA, he was at Clark. Um, he was in jail in Turkey for many years as a political, uh, as a political prisoner, for, um, as a youth. A managed to escape, went to Germany, and then uh, came to the United States. But recently, in, in an article in the journal, um, uh, 
uh, but Dennis does that review. Um, uh, his article is, uh, when uh, was the decision to an annihilate the Armenians taken? And uh, this was online in 2019. You, you can read the whole article if you'd like. Um, and you can just Google it, it'll come up. And, and his, and I think he's very convincing here. It's a very different way of looking at it. Um, he argues that the official central CUP decision was taken between February 15th and March 3rd, 1915. So a little bit earlier than most people have, um, that even he earlier was saying, when he, he used to argue, he was one of those who argued for late March, early April. Um, and he's, he, he's now refined, refined that. But this was only on implementation. That is, he said, between uh, February 15th and March 3rd, 1915, what the CUP was trying to come to grips with was how they were going to do it, not whether they were going to do it. Okay. The decision, actually, he thinks is a more organic process from the ground up. Of, and it was already decided on the local levels of the regions of Bonn and the city of Bitlis, he's also in Bonn, uh, in meetings in December 1914, before the wartime trouble started. That is, it's not because they had this huge loss at Sadiqamish and they need a scapegoat that the Armenian Genocide starts, but really already before that, there are, uh, there are local reasons for why they want the Armenian population eliminated. And then the, gen the, the defeat on, uh, uh, at the Battle of Sadiqamish provides further impetus for the central government to start getting its act together in order to uh, put this into full motion. And he argues that the provincial governors play an important role in the actual um, uh, program of the genocide. And so it's not a top-down, I was just following orders. It was, hey, we have Armenians and we need to get rid of them. Can you give us support? Can you tell us we're allowed to do this? Right? And again, one of the interesting things he does in this article, and then he has another article, particularly on the Kurdish, um, because it's always complex on the Kurdish role in, uh, in, in the genocide, is that a lot of the governors um, also complain that the Kurds are killing Armenians. The same, right, and this is the question, like, why would they do that? They're, they're killing the Armenians, why are they angry when the Kurds do it? It's because this really is a totalitarian state. They need to control all violence that happens in the state. They can't have uncontrolled violence. This is not a massacre in that way. This is a state planned and organized exercise of power. And everything that happens has to be under their control. And in, in that sense, it's very much ideologically um, embedded in the formation of, uh, of what the CUP wants uh, the Ottoman Empire to become. Um, and, and that process of ethnic elimination uh, in order to make uh, Turkey more homogenous uh, is critical uh, to their program. Um, so this, I, I think this is a, a very good article, and he does this by most, the documents he uses to support this are telegrams that are written from the provincial governors to the, uh, to the central government. They are in code, they are encoded, and so part of what needed to be, why this took so long is that that code had to be decoded. And we don't have the coding um, equivalents for, for all of the codes. Uh, I'm not a specialist in cryptology, um, but apparently they had different types of codes that they used. We do have books that explain two of them, but not all of them, uh, uh, as far as I, uh, as I can recall. So that's how he uh, based this research, and um, he's still working on it, it's still coming out, but it, and what he has so far to me is quite convincing. So this is something new for this year that, that, that uh, they refer to. Regardless of when it was actually um, uh, conceived, uh, the beginning starts, as I said, in February 1915, immediately after the, um, the, the, the defeat at Sadiq In February 1915, the Armenians are disarmed. Uh, it became illegal for Armenians to carry weapons. Uh, this was often used as, a, as an excuse for rounding them up. Um, so obviously, a lot of Armenians had, um, had, had arms for hunting uh, at home, but even the ones in the, uh, the military uh, were disarmed and they were put into labor with um, on April 8th, um, there's one particular area um, that has historically been troublesome, it's called Zaytun, um, and it's a very mountainous region, and the people there have, um, uh, have, have always been somewhat independent in their mind, in, in their thinking, um, and on April 8th, and you can see as they're gearing up, they tend to go to the more problematic areas first, before anybody knows what's going on, 
and deport the people out of them so that there can be no um, concerted uh, resistance later on. Surprise. Yeah. And surprise. Yeah, surprise, right. So they don't know what's happening too. And then April 19, again, massacres in the Van region. As they said, Van was the province that had a majority of Armenians, so they start there. Um, and we can see them move uh, from region to region, going with the most Armenians uh, to, to the ones with the least. And then, as I noted, on April 24th, uh, approximately 250 Armenian leaders in Constantinople were arrested and, 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 and killed. By 1916, over 1 million dead, 500,000 displaced, and then by 1923, 1.5 million have been murdered. Um, to give you a sense, this map, so I think you can see it, because it is, these are the areas, again, the darker the red, the greater the Armenian population um, in, the, in, in these areas. And then this is, it doesn't show up the, 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 the most, uh, but, uh, and this lighting, but this is 1914, that's 1926. And as you can see, it pretty much disappears. Um, so and that's a, um, I think that, that's a pretty clear graphic, that, and this is from Robert Houston's uh, atlas. Now, obviously there's a paradigm here, right? And I'm sure you guys have studied this in class as well, that again, it was not random, as I said, it was state controlled, and there's a method um, to how they're going to do it. So first of all, you prepare the population by continuing to use rhetoric that dehumanizes and depersonalizes Armenian. You see them as an illness. Um, they're depicted as a disease and vermin, rats. Um, even today, um, it can be synonymous with dog. They call someone an Armenian. If you want to insult someone, you call them an Armenian. Um, so you get these very strange news reports of like, uh, like Turkish people insulting Kurds by calling them Armenians, and, uh, the, and then the Kurds going back and calling the Turks the third Armenians. Um, very disturbing. And there was a pattern to the extermination. Uh, the men were gathered, held, and marched out of town, where they were subsequently shot or, or banded if they needed to save bullets. Often they would take them not they wouldn't do this. They would take them to a town first have them write back to their relatives to tell them that they're okay, then they would take them out um, and, and kill them. After that had happened, the elderly uh, and women and children were told that they would have to leave for their own security. Um, and um, they were, a complete inventory was taken of property. Um, and there were two sets of lists, one for uh, Constantinople, the other one that was kept in the local archives. And I know some Turkish scholars who are working on trying to get um, to get access to the, to, the, to the local ones that were kept, um, uh, because it's almost impossible to get to the national ones. But to the to local archives, so they have better they have better um, access. They were then marched through the desert towards Aleppo, then along the Euphrates to places like Deir Zor. And I don't know if you can, this map is not really big enough on here, and I don't have a um, a, uh, a, a pointer. Um, but basically, you can see all of the um, all of the routes go to these concentration camps along the, uh, along the Euphrates, um, and then uh, there was a giant concentration camp at their tour um, where uh, hundreds of thousands died. And then, of course, this was um, simultaneity. Uh, between April and August 1915, the Armenians of nearly every major town and village were deported. So again, that, those are the months we talked about 800,000 are killed. Uh, but nearly everybody is uh, emptied out. And we also have this from reports of other people who were there saying that their villages are now empty. Um, and so these are some of the patterns. The other, uh, the other pattern is that they use technology and organization. Again, this was not a series of random acts. The telegraph, as I noted, was used to communicate orders. Um, new railway, railway lines transported Armenians in packed cars. This is, again, a familiar trope. They were often forced to buy the ticket first, <laughs> then put in the cars uh, where they were packed. Um, some of them died because of that. Often the train was stopped in the middle of the desert. People were taken out and shot. Um, and so they never reached their destination. And they kept them out. Um, a special organization, the Teshkelete Masusa, was formed, especially, it was really, I mean, it was to eliminate internal en enemies of the Ottoman Empire, but its charge was really the elimination of of the Armenian Empire. So again, you should know that there were German officers present for a lot of this who did report back on it, some of whom also became concentration camp 
um, leaders in their own day in, in World War II and, and learn some of the techniques uh, from here. And again, Armenians were gathered in concentration camps. Unfortunately, these are all familiar patterns. The other thing is the legalization of genocide. Again, it's a totalitarian state. These are not massacres. This is an actual, this is the exercise of power by the state. And between May and December of 1915, there were a series of law that authorized, this laws that authorized the deportation of the Armenians, right? This was not just willy-nilly. They passed laws saying we can do this. Um, they secured and registered the property of Armenians while relocated. So this is what they did. They told them, as I said, we're going to make a list of everything you have so that when you come back, you can get it, right? Here's the list. We're good, right? I have one. We want to go to central government. You'll be able to get everything back. Like when you're arrested and you have to put things in the, yeah? um, not, not speaking personal. Um, but they, obviously, they're not coming back. So now what do they do? They have to pass another law saying if nobody comes back within a certain period of time to reclaim their property, this property devolves to the state. And the state now owns this property, and they set up uh, the Abandoned Properties uh, Administration Commission every 15 days. This commission is reporting on the status of these properties. So this is a big deal. And, uh, and then afterwards, they create a mechanism by which these properties and all of the stuff that was uh, collected could be liquidated. Uh, how the state could sell it off or give it to people that it needed, uh, it wanted to. So there's a whole mechanism in place. And um, Talat Pasha himself, when he was, he was later assassinated by Sohomon Tehmirian, who's great in Fresno, if anybody ever wants to go visit. Um, he, was, he was assassinated in Berlin uh, by Solomon Tehmeria. Um, and on him, he still kept the, his like, little notebook in which he listed the properties that they had accumulated. And in this book, um, uh, he, he basically numbered the following. Over 20,000 buildings, over 267,000 acres of land, uh, almost 77,000 acres of vineyards, uh, almost 704,000 acres of olives, and um, over 4,500 acres of mulberry gardens, right? And all that he personally was able to account for had been confiscated. And so this was, um, and the image here to the right uh, is one of these receipts of, uh, of properties that had been uh, confiscated uh, that you could later claim. So if we, going back in, that there's a pattern to the killing that it used technology and organization that it was legalized, right? These are all signs or patterns of modern genocides. And it really, it really is coterminous with the onset of modernity. The other, I would say, more positive side of it, if there is a positive side, is also, it's the first case to really be internationalized. Um, there were nearly 200 articles in the New York Times uh, written about it between 1915 and 1922. And you can see here, million Armenians uh, killed or in exile, uh, American Committee on Relief says victims of Turks are steadily increasing policy of extermination. The reason why they're using these terms is because the word genocide didn't exist yet. As you may have learned already, Raphael Lemkin coined it in 1944 to um, really describe how this is different than the kinds of killings uh, that we have seen in the past or in, in other contexts. And this was based on his, his own study of the Armenian genocide first and foremost, but then of, of course of his own family during the Holocaust. So he, he, based on those two primarily accounts, he came up with the term genocide. But we can see the newspapers here, the New York Times headlines, trying to describe what's going on. So it's a policy of extermination, right? And we have reports that you may remember that the United States was officially neutral in World War I, um, and so our, we still had our embassy there. And we had our consulates um, uh, throughout the empire. And we have consular reports and a report of Henry Morgenthau, who was the US ambassador, uh, about what was going on. And he, he actually confronted Talat Pasha about this. And Talat Pasha said to him, if we leave any one of them alive, because he said, you're killing children. It's like, yes, because if these children grow up and they know what we did to their parents, what do you think they'll do to us? And so he said everybody had to be killed so that they wouldn't have um, the fear of revenge later on. And then we have. Franz Berkel's 40 Days of Musada, uh, written in 1933. It's a fictionalized account of an actual event, um, but it became widely popular. Um, uh, uh, and it's about a, 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 group, a couple of villages of Armenians that withstand the Ottoman army um, on, the, on the Mediterranean coast. 
they're in the mountains, they're able to uh, withstand the army, and they get rescued by, uh, by the French Navy uh, at the end. Um, and that, that this happened, but it, it also made, uh, you know, again, reinforce the popular image of what happened uh, during World War I. So it, it's very incredible, and there's not a lot of time to go into this right now, how, if you're looking at 1930, 1930, everybody knows about the Armenian Genocide. It's not like you would hear later on, what? Yeah, I sort of heard of it, maybe I heard of it. Um, I did want to ask, how many of you learned about it in high school? A couple of people, few, yeah, no, which is great. However, it is a law in California that you have to learn about it in high school, and so I'm sort of um, not, not great that some of you didn't hear about it because um, uh, you actually have to learn about it because, it, because knowledge of it had gotten to such a, had, had been lost. And, and so it's now mandatory in the school system. Um, but you know, if you're looking at it in the 1920s and 30s, um, particularly for the relief efforts, right? The Ar uh, American Committee for Relief in the N Near East, still around today, as the Near East Relief Fund was founded to help raise money, particularly really for Armenian um, uh, orphans and survivors. And between 1960 and 1930, the U.S. raised 116 million dollars in relief money. That's probably five billion today, given the inflation and everything. This 2.5 billion is an old, big, old equivalent that I use, but whatever. It's a lot of money. It was the most money that's ever been raised for a single relief effort, um, uh, and so and it, and it involved presidents. Politics. This is the first time, really, in relief history, right, uh, that we had all of these people who were involved in actually trying to help another country that we supposedly had no interest. Uh, about, right, just out of humanitarian purposes. So former presidents, politicians, celebrities, Babe Ruth auctioned off his baseball bat uh, that he hit home run with um, in order to support Armenians. And so I, I also mention this because part of the reason why it should be taught in our school system is because America actually did a lot. It's a major part of our own history that we normally don't learn about. And, and the reason why we don't learn about it is because the Republic of Turkey very early on, starting in the late 30s and 40s, um, started to put political pressure on governments to try and squash. I mean, obviously part of it was, you know, World War II, other things happened, but there was a, a conscientious effort by the Republic of Turkey to squash any discussion of the Armenian Genocide. So when they wanted to turn um, uh, Franz Verkel's book into a movie, the State Department called up Michael Golden Mayer, so it's ironic that Kirk McCormick later becomes uh, uh, CEO, but, um, and told them you're not going to make that movie. Uh, and then we, of course, had uh, Turkey enters NATO. Uh, Turkey is a very important partner, uh, partner uh, against the Soviet Union. We have a radar base, uh, we have an airfield in, 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 in Turkey at Inalji. So, for these reasons, there's no real incentive on the US side to talk about it either. And so, it lingers for decades as sort of unspoken. Uh, and only recently has come back to the fore with a great crescendo up to the uh, centenary in 2015. Uh, and thankfully, uh, that has been, it's, since then, it's only getting more and more prominent. So uh, we can feel better about that. However, having said that, there are still troubling signs. As I said, this may have happened 108 years ago, but because Turkey denies it to this day, um, it isn't over in many respects. So, you may have heard that there's a conflict going on in Nagorno-Karabakh, the Artsakh for Armenians. Uh, you may have heard about this in the news in 2020. Um, it's still in the news today, and I, I just want to give a little bit of context, um, historical context, again, very briefly. So Nagorno-Karabakh is an Armenian enclave which had been surrounded by Azerbaijan in, uh, in the Soviet period. Um, it was known as an autonomous oblast, is what they called it in, 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 in Russian, um, and so, this is a problem that the Soviets faced in a couple of areas where you had uh, ethnic groups um, that controlled a significant amount of territory but were within other, other regions. And there are d disputes as to why the Soviets created these oblasts. Uh, some people say it was to weaken um, uh, local populations. So as you can possibly see, our, you know, the Gordon Karabakh, here's the Republic of Armenia. <coughs> And here's Nagorno-Karabakh. The question is always been why the Soviets just make it all Armenian, right, rather than doing it this way. Um, there are debates. Some of them lead to 
to weaken these ethnic minorities. The other ones were um, that they were just trying to solve a problem that is pretty difficult to solve. Um, and so, and it's the question of territorial integrity versus uh, ethnic right to self determination. So they came up with this autonomous oblast sort of resolution in which, yes, Azerbaijan, the Republic of Azerbaijan, technically included the autonomous region of Nagorno-Karabakh, but the Armenians there had a, a great deal of autonomy. Um, in 1988, however, as the Soviet Union is headed towards collapse, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh votes to join Armenia. This was a legal vote within the Soviet Union. Um, and immediately anti-Armenian protests and pogroms start in Azerbaijan, and populations uh, begin to leave. And I have to say this happens on both sides. Azeris who are living in Armenian territory move to Azerbaijan, and Armenians in, in Azerbaijan, and particularly in Baku, uh, start to leave uh, Azerbaijan and move to Armenia. And there are about 350,000 Armenians who leave, leave um, uh, Azerbaijan itself. And there have been conflicts over this, for this past century, uh, but really um, it starts to boil over in the late 80s uh, and early 90s. Um, Armenia and Azerbaijan declare independence from the USSR in 91, um, and Nagorno-Karabakh holds a, a referendum, which was boycotted by any of the, uh, any of the Azeris in Nagorno-Karabakh, but nonetheless, they were not the majority of the population. And 98% of the population, again, in another legally held vote, uh, went for independence. That is not to join Armenia, not to be part of Azerbaijan, but to be their own country. And they've had their own government, their own flag, their own military um, ever since then. Um, and it's not recognized by anyone else, but uh, not even the Republic of Armenia officially recognizes an independent Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh for its own political reasons, so that, so that the war, there's no excuse for the war to spread to Armenia. But nonetheless, um, they've continued with this sort of um, separate government since then. In 1992 to 94, we get a full-scale war. Uh, uh, thousands died during that war. The Armenians, however, were successful, and they gained the what's here in the darker beige um, areas around the Gorno Karabakh that linked the Gorno Karabakh to Armenia. And they, there is a pass called the Lachin Pass that links these two together. They built a road for Krikorian funded a lot of that road um, that links the two places together so that you can move easily and get supplies and food uh, back and forth. Um, and the ceasefire came into effect in May 12, 94, and, and it did, in effect, up until uh, based, really, basically until uh, uh, 2020. One other thing I'd just like to point out that Nahijaman, on the other side of the Republic of Armenia, was also given by the Soviets to Azerbaijan, although it was historically an Armenian, uh, an Armenian uh, area that had um, over, well over 100 churches, well over 110 Armenian churches, Armenian graveyards. There was a, a large Armenian presence there. Um, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, but uh, I just want to point that out right now and keep it in the back of your mind. So in 2020, um, on September 27th, uh, Azari forces, um, this is the line of contact that basically the ceasefire, that, that red line that had come up with. Azari forces um, cross that line of contact uh, they had su uh, superior military firepower and Turkish support. Uh, sometimes talk about five armies actually supported the the uh, the Azeri onslaught, um, and the Armenians basically had no one. Uh, the Russians played a canny game. Um, the Russians are the only ones to um, really declare any sort of defensive support for Armenia, and Iran also helps um, uh, too. Uh, but Russian support is a mixed blessing. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later. Um, and November 8th, um, Shushi in Armenia, Shusha in, in Azri was taken by the Azerbaijani army. Um, and that's a very strategic location. It has the high ground. Um, Armenian forces captured it in the first war by scaling it um, in what was like a D-Day operation for them. Uh, the Azeris got it back and the loss of Shushi you basically, the Armenians knew they couldn't fight anymore because from there they could bomb um, without, um, without any sort of obstacle the population uh, below. The ceasefire was signed on November 9th, that was brokered by Russia, um, and it was signed by uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. And uh, basically, according to the ceasefire, all of those territories, 
uh, that you now see here that had been uh, uh, under Armenian control were now ceded to Azerbaijan. So all the ones that are not salmon, uh, the, the greenish ones, are now under Azeri control, including, the, well, the Lachin Pass was interesting, but the Lachin Pass technically, the, the pass that connects Armenia and the North Karabakh was technically supposed to be under Russian uh, observation and control, according to the uh, according to the, uh, uh, the agreement. The other part of the agreement was there's supposed to be down here in the south um, a way to link these two uh, peacefully. There's supposed to be a corridor that links um, this part of the newly conquered lands uh, by Azerbaijan with uh, Nahichaba. That has become a bone of contention too, because recently Azerbaijan has just thought maybe we can just invade that um, as well. It hasn't fully happened, but the, the towns down there have come under attack. And so this is where we get to whether, looking at this, some people, remember what I said at the beginning, once genocide happened, it's very hard to start. And on the other hand, when talking about this, when you talk about what people are like, oh, you're exaggerating, all they really want is like to maintain their territorial integrity. The results, however, of what's happened so far have been disastrous. We have a refugee crisis of uh, people from the Gorda Karbak. Um, apparently there's still 30,000 uh, um, Armenians from the Gorda Karbak who have not come back uh, to, they call it Artsakh. There is the crisis of cultural heritage. Now this is where I come back to the Hichabon that I was talking about. Part of the reason why we are concerned about what happens in the Gorda Karabakh is because we do have a blueprint for what happened in Nahichaban, which is 98% of Armenian monuments were destroyed. And we have this on satellite. Um, there's wonderful articles by Simon Mahakian out of Denver, who's a great, great reporter. Um, also, uh, Caucasus Heritage Watch out of Cornell has done work um, in, in, in showing us. What you see at the top there, um, uh, tombstones of the Nahichaban, um, that, that was in 2005. They took Armenians, uh, one of their uh, traditional arts are called khachkars, that's a cross stone, and they can be commemorative, and they're, they're often in, in, in uh, cemeteries. They're like a tombstone, but usually bigger, um, and, that, and they are, um, uh, they have bar reliefs on them, uh, or they're, uh, in, in their inscriptions, and the, the Azari, um, Azerbaijani uh, military just um, collected them, smashed them to pieces, and turned them to cement. Uh, to use for cement. Um, so they're all gone. Uh, 108 to 110 churches, maybe, were destroyed. Um, uh, and the monastery of Afra uh, they leveled that and they built a new mosque. Um, so that sort of cultural destruction um, is uh, uh, you know, documented for Nechichevan, and so there's fear that that's going to happen again in the Gorna Karabakh, eventually. In the meantime, uh, they have destroyed some sites. I mean, this happened during the war where they, they bombed Sir Kazan Jetsot's cathedral um, uh, in, in Shushi. It's now under Azerbaijani control, so we don't know what the status of that is going to be ultimately. Um, and uh, the other, this is a complicated thing, but they've started to rewrite Armenian history. So in, in, the, in the sense of they think of inscriptions on Armenian churches as forgeries, and so they started to deface the inscription, saying that these are all later forgeries, and so they're getting rid of them. Of course, there are also the evidence that shows that these are Armenian churches. This gets complicated because there is a people known as the Caucasian Albanians. It has nothing to do with Albanians in Albania. In Armenia, they're known as the Akhmak, that lived in this area as well. They were, um, um, ethnically, they're separate from Armenians. They had their own alphabet that the same person who invented the Armenian alphabet invented for them. Um, we don't, we had very little preserved in it. Um, in, in fact, it's like a couple of um, leaves of a psalter, I think it's a psalter. Um, and by the, uh, by the 10th century, they're thoroughly harmonized. And to the point where the only history we have the Caucasian Albanians, it's called the history of the Caucasian Albanians, written by Moses Daskoransi is written in Armenian because they're very harmonized. They had their own narratives, their own, their own church, they had their own church hierarchy, but it was thoroughly um, integrated with the Armenian church. And they really stopped existing as a, a separate ethnic identity sometime 
between the 10th and 15th century. Don't know exactly when. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done there. But as an identifiable, self-identifying group, they've pretty much become, uh, they've been harmonized. Some of them undoubtedly became Azri at some point, or Persian, or Turkish. I mean, they went all different ways. Uh, but historically, the majority of them probably were just harmonized. Um, so there is a small group north of, uh, in, 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 in the southern Caucasus, north of Armenia, known as the Uti. And their language is related to Caucasian Albanian. And we, there's a whole complex issue of what the Caucasian Albanian spoke historically. We don't know how many languages they spoke, what, how connected they were. But anyway, the language that they speak there, the, the, the in Uti, is, 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 is definitely related to that. And so what Azerbaijan has tried to do is say that these churches all belong to this small community of Uti who happen to be they're Orthodox, they're not Armenian Apostolic, and I forget what the, I, uh, they're their own like, little Orthodox group. And their start, they want to take back these churches for themselves, and the Azeris are saying that the Armenian inscriptions on them that are later forgeries that they did after taking over the churches. So that this is a very subtle game of cultural appropriation and, and erasure. Uh, it's not as blatant as just destroying the building, but what they want to do is, link, is erase any linkage of cultural monuments in the area to Armenian and Armenians. And of course, this is complicated. When these things were built, there was no nation state anywhere. Um, people weren't thinking in those terms, so nobody wrote down, like, this is an Armenian building, don't touch it, or something like that. So, I mean, it, it's, but it is a dangerous, um, it's a dangerous historical game that they're, that, that they're playing. Um, now, in addition, starting December 12th, how many of you were aware of this? 120,000 Armenians are starving. Yeah, a couple of people, but it's not gotten a lot of news. Other things have gotten on, but it's sort of frustrating when there isn't a lot of news on this uh, at all. They but were starving before that. Yeah, yeah the, the official not blockade. Not yeah, oh, right. But there's an official blockade. Well, official blockade. There's a blockade, um, apparently, uh, by Azerbaijanis who are eco uh, climate activists. And they're saying they're having a climate blockade of this past. I forget what their actual justification is, it's so ridiculous. Um, but there was, a, on Twitter the, the other day, there was an interesting thing. There was another protest in Azerbaijan by the town of Satli asking for some reforms. And apparently, the Azerbaijani police had no problem shooting them. But they're not going to touch these eco climate activists who are blocking this, uh, blocking the pass. So nothing, no medical supplies can get in or out of uh, Northern Karabakh. The Russians have tried to airlift some things in. There have been some relief efforts, but basically they're on ration for food, um, and uh, the situation um, it continues to deteriorate um, uh, while this is, you know, while everything else is going on. There are also military attacks uh, on Armenians in the Karabakh. Three police officers were killed the other day, um, and in Armenia, there have been attacks on cities in Armenia. So it's not just the Karabakh, as I said. They want that linkage between Azerbaijan and Nahichevan, and Turkey wants a linkage that goes from Azerbaijan to Nahichevan to Turkey, and, and so uh, they bombed villages on the border. Um, they had an actual incursion. They were forced to withdraw thanks to um, the Russians. The Iranians are also very skeptical. They don't want the Azerbaijan. They don't want Azerbaijan to have this control either. So they uh, also tried uh, to keep things uh, more restrained, um, but. Obviously, Russia has other things going on right now, um, and Iran also has other things going on right now, so you know, to rely on them is not necessarily a great uh, security plan. Uh, but I think the most uh, telling and the most uh, worrisome is the rhetoric that comes out of both Istanbul and uh, uh, Baku. And so here you have um, Aliyev in 2022, saying Western Azerbaijan, that's what he referred, he refers to the Republic of Armenia as Western Azerbaijan, um, <laughs> right? is our historical land, so that they're gonna absorb all of this. Um, and Erdogan, during the victory uh, parade in 2020, he came, he spoke after the, the victory in the war, he said, today, the soul of Nuri Pasha and Ver Pasha um, and the brave soldiers of the Caucasian Islamic army will rejoice. Now, Nuri Pasha was um, uh, Enver Pasha's brother-in-law, 
and he was in charge of the arm of the Ottoman armies that invaded the Caucasus uh, at the end of the war, uh, and tried to commit the gen complete the genocide. Thankfully, uh, Armenian forces at the Battle of Sadarabad were able to uh, stop uh, uh, the invading army, and that's why there is a Republic of Armenia um, today. Uh, because otherwise, they would have completed what had been started. And Enver Pasha, as I said, was one of the three Pashas who blamed the Armenians uh, for the disaster at Sadiqamish. So here you have Erdogan praising two people who were instrumental in trying to commit the genocide uh, of, the, uh, of the Armenians. Um, and he's doing this after uh, the other Rajani victory uh, in Nagorno Karabakh. And then even earlier, Aliyev in 2018, um, saying Yerevan, and this is, quote, that's the Russian spelling of it, um, uh, in our historical land, uh, so Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, is our historical land, and we, the Azerbaijanis, must return to these historical lands. Now, whether, you know, some people have said, no, come on, he doesn't really have genocidal uh, intentions, he just wants, he just needs to have red meat to keep his own population happy so that they don't turn against him, because it's true, it's a dictatorial regime, Azerbaijanis do not have a great you know, political life at all, um, there is a sense in which they look upon Armenia as dysfunctional as it is, is a constitutional republic, uh, and there is democracy. Some people even argue there may be too much democracy, but it is there. Um, there is corruption, but at least they're free. There's a free press, um, there's freedom of religion, um, there's freedom uh, to gather. None of this exists in Azerbaijan. And so there is an extent to which he needs to justify his own position by creating this enemy. However, whether he means it or not is irrelevant because the people he's talking to understand it as he meaning it. And, and, that's, and that's really uh, what's important to the point where I don't know, another thing that went around on, on Twitter the other day, I don't know if there was a wrestling match between an Armenian and an Azerbaijani. And the Armenian won. And at the end, he went to shake his hand and the Azerbaijani just punched him in the face. So. And that's, but I mean, there's a degree of real um, animosity there. Um, and, and that's what's frightening. Normally, I, I like to leave this um, lecture on a positive note, and that was like possible up until <laughs> last year or the year before. And now it, it isn't, and I'm sorry about that. Because it, you know, we had, they made them, the people who died in the genocide, the, the Armenian church made them martyrs and saints so that you could pray to them for intercession. And it was like a big turning point. They did this in 2015 where you could start looking to the past, but it was a turning towards the future. And then in 2019, I mean, it was, it was for the 2020 lecture, I was able to talk about the United States finally recognizing it. But then quickly after that, we had this, uh, this situation. And unfortunately, right now, um, because of the uh, uncertain global context, I don't know how this one is going to turn out. I mean, it is very frightening. Obviously, uh, Russia is uh, preoccupied with Ukraine. Um, it's in, in that war of aggression, and it's depleted Russian forces tremendously, which is obviously a strategic interest. On the other hand, for the region, that's a disaster. Um, and there are no good outcomes. I, I, I mean, I, to that war, I don't see a good act, outcome. Um, because if the Russians lose, the, the region loses as well. If the Russians win, that's also a disaster. Or, you know, you don't want to think that they can just take any country they want. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very bad situation. Armenia is strategically indebted uh, uh, to Russia, but they, they don't see this as a, a moral position. They see it as leverage. Um, and they will leverage that situation as much as they can. Um, and so that is just not a, a great uh, position to be in. In the meantime, um, the war in Ukraine has also driven um, European uh, powers into Azerbaijan's hands even further because when they cut themselves off from Russian oil, they went to Azerbaijan. So now 40% of Italy's oil comes from Azerbaijan. Um, Azerbaijan has uh, wealthy oil reserves in the Caspian, um, and uh, that makes sure that any sort of resolution, as much as the right words are said, remain at the level of words. Uh, because if they turn off the tap, that would be a disaster for Europe. They can't, uh, uh, they can't withstand that, losing both of those. Uh, uh, both of those, uh, yeah, both of those accesses to, to, to oil. So this is uh, a, a tense situation. Um, hopefully, uh, I mean, all the right people have condemned the blockade. No one's done anything about it, um, and 
I don't know where we go from here, but I mean, hopefully uh, next year I, I can have better news um, and, and that there's been a resolu uh, resolution to this conflict. But thank, thank you all for coming, and, and please, I'm happy to answer any questions.